This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gido Ewart. It's Wednesday, July 17th. This is Africa 54. Sudan's military council and the pro-democracy coalition sign a power-sharing deal to officially end the political turmoil. Survivors and analysts of the Democratic Republic of Congo's violence talk about the decades-old conflict in the Turi and Kivu provinces that just won't stop. And online retail e-commerce platform Jumia Food targets lower-income earners in its quest to dominate the African market. Sudan's ruling military council and a pro-democracy alliance signed a political accord on Wednesday as part of a power-sharing deal aimed at leading the nation on a path to democratic elections. Emily Wither reports. Sudan's ruling generals and protest leaders making history in the capital Khartoum. The two sides signed a political accord on Wednesday as part of a power-sharing deal aimed at leading the nation to democracy. The agreement was reached earlier this month, but after a series of delays, talks ran late into the night as final details were ironed out. The deal is meant to pave the way to a political transition in Sudan after military leaders ousted former president Omar al-Bashir in April. It followed weeks of protests against him and a deadly crackdown. This gathering at the weekend was the first demonstration since a power-sharing agreement was reached. Tens of thousands of protesters marked 40 days since security forces killed dozens when they stormed a protest camp in Khartoum. They want those responsible for the killings to be held to account. That could prove a sticking point in future talks, and there are still many obstacles to overcome. The sides are working on a constitutional declaration, which is expected to be signed on Friday. That was Emily Wither of Reuters reporting. Now for more on the signed peace deal, reporter Naba Mohideen joins me on the phone from Khartoum. Good evening, Naba. The much-anticipated peace deal has finally been inked. What's the reaction in Khartoum? Uh, good evening. The reaction in Khartoum, uh, people, uh, some people are, are celebrating, but the celebration is not very big. It's not in the streets uh, because people think that the constitutional draft is, most, uh, is the most important issue. Uh, as the political draft is the same even before June 10, which was the bloody event took place in Khartoum. So people, uh, the, the streets of Khartoum is, is not, um, are not filled with activists and protesters like, uh, like before when they announced the agreement initially in July the 5th. Now, Naba, the, the uh, constitutional, constitutional declaration, which is expected to be signed this Friday, uh, seems to be a contentious issue here. Uh, what are the key issues, really, on this subject? Uh, the, the, uh, the key issue in the constitutional draft is the uh, authorities of the sovereign council, the legislative council, and the ministers' council. And the, uh, the authorities and... Um, the relation, governing relation between the three councils and also the immunity. It will discuss the immunity that TMT has uh, asked uh, for its member, uh, sorry, for its members. So it's awaited more than the political agreement. Naba, again, uh, there is this thorny issue about the military council requesting immunities for some of its members so that they don't face justice because of the deaths that followed the protests. Uh, what is the uh, FCC, uh, the Coalition of Forces for uh, Demo Democracy and Change, what is their position on this? Um, yes, our position has discussed this in the political agreement also because uh, protesters were angry and the, uh, the protest erupted again after the declaration of the agreement on July 5th uh, after the TNC asked for the immunity. So people... Um, make bigger protests in all, in all of Sudan, in every city, in every street. So it's 
So uh, opposition uh, discussed this in the political agreement, and they said that the immunity, uh, the immunity will not be full. Uh, it will uh, be um, if if the members are convicted by criminal uh, cases, they will be uh, on trial. But it will be uh, the last uh, discussion on this, and the final decision and the agreement will be made on Friday. So it's discussed, but not uh, yeah, not yet agreed. Uh, very briefly, Naba, does this uh, sovereign council favor any of the sides, the military council or the FCC? Sorry, I didn't uh, hear the question. All right, Naba, we're running out of time, but we'll touch base again. Thank you very much. Naba Mohideen is a cartoon-based reporter. Now, for decades, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, especially the Ituri and North Kivu provinces, have endured ethnic violence, leaving thousands dead and many more seeking refuge in neighboring countries. Halim Athumani spoke with some survivors of DRC violence at a refugee settlement in western Uganda and with analysts about why the conflict continues. 54-year-old Mamoye Chantal has lived in a Ugandan refugee settlement for six years now after fleeing violence in Congo's North Kivu province. When she arrived, Chantal found long-lost family members who had fled the same region during what's known as the First Congo War in 1996 and 1997. Chantal explains why she thinks fighting has persisted since the end of the 32-year rule of the late Mobutu Seseko. He held the country like he owned it all alone. During the fighting, it seems they discovered that Congo has minerals, so everyone is now fighting for the wealth in Congo. DRC refugees continue to arrive at the Uganda border by the boat load. Refugee Joshua Oshaki says he lost contact with his wife during the fighting in DRC's Ituri region, but managed to escape with his two children. In the beginning, the conflict was tribal. Different tribes fought each other. The Hema and the Lendu would be joined by the Wangiti and other tribes. They would kill each other. Currently, the fighting has faces of government soldiers and civilians. Even as the DRC's people struggle to survive, the country is considered one of the richest countries in the world in mineral wealth. But critics say few benefits are harnessed by the state for ordinary people while mining companies and the elite get rich. Who supports the, the strong militiamen, the individuals who hold sway in the, in the vast lands of controlling properties and areas. Who does that? So certainly foreign powers are involved. Certainly countries neighboring DRC are involved, all of them. They have interests in a DRC that is not as stable as it should be. Last week, Presidents Paul Kagame of Rwanda, Yoram Seveni of Uganda, Yao Lorenko of Angola, and Congo President Felix Tisekedi held a meeting in Luanda to discuss, among others, the security situation in the Great Lakes region. The three countries, plus Burundi and Eritrea, escalated the 1996 conflict in Congo, then known as Zaire, either by sending state forces or backing militia groups to defeat various rebel groups based in Congo. It's not clear yet whether the meeting will yield any new effort to end the suffering of Congolese people who have to flee their homes. Halima Asmani for VA News, Hoima, Uganda. Deforestation has devastated many African countries, but in the West African nation of Niger, more than 200 million new trees have sprung up in recent decades. These trees, mainly a variety known locally as Gao, weren't planted. Instead, they were protected by Nigerian farmers who realized the trees were assets to agriculture and animal feed. Moki Edwin Kinzeka narrates this report by Anne Nzuankeo. Ibrahim Umar says Nigerian farmers like himself began noticing some decades ago that they got good yields from crops planted under the winter horn tree, known locally as the Gao tree. We no longer cut the Gao because the Gao is a very important tree for us. People like it in their fields and gardens because with this tree in their garden, what they sow produces well. Cattle ranchers also discovered their animals could eat the trees, leaves and fruits. 
For animal feed, what the animals like the most is the bean leaves, secondly, the peanut leaves. We also now give them, thirdly, the gao leaves, and they like it. So instead of chopping down the gao trees for firewood, farmers and cattle ranchers began protecting them. The result is over 200 million more trees in Niger today than three decades ago, say experts. Niger's regreening efforts of more than 5 million hectares have inspired neighboring countries like Burkina Faso, which has brought poor farmers here to Niger to learn, Mali, which has also brought poor farmers, and also the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The Gao tree is the only tree that produces throughout Niger's eight months dry season. By protecting the Gao tree, Niger's farmers and cattle ranchers have not only increased their production, they have dramatically expanded the country's green areas and pushed back the encroaching desert. For An Zwanke in Niamey, Niger, Moki, Edwin Kinzika, for VOA News. We are inching closer to the end of Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt, where Africa 54 sports reporter Sande Shamari is standing by in Cairo. Good evening, Sande. Tell us about the third place game between Tunisia and Nigeria. Both teams are eyeing the win. What are you hearing from the players and coaches, Sande? Esther, this is a very special night for these two teams, but at the same time, Esther, as you know, these two teams were broken on the semi-finals. So tonight, everyone is eyeing for the consolation prize, if you will, which is the bronze medal. Now, on the other side, this is a fight of the Eagles, Carthage Eagles from Tunisia and Super Eagles from Nigeria, Esther. And what are, what are they saying tonight is that Nigerian coach says this is a very important game because they need consolation to go back home and also their international player Mikel Obi probably this is the last international game he won't be playing for international team anymore so it's very important for Nigeria and John Mikel Obi on the same note Tunisian side is complaining blaming the new system VAR that denied them a penalty kick against the last match of the semi-final but tonight Tunisians are saying this is the night to make sure they go home with something because the last time they were in this position was back in 2004, Esther. So they need this. But I also spoke to some of the analysts here and I had to speak with prior Timothy Olubulu. He's a analyst from Nairobi, Kenya, Capital FM. And I wanted to know his take on this important game tonight. This is a match that no team wants to play. It's the match that every team that comes to a tournament wants to avoid to play. But all said and done, uh, you have something to fight for. You want to go home with a, with a medal around your neck. So they, there's everything to fight for. Yes, they didn't get to the final, but you have a bronze medal to fight for. Uh, Tunisia haven't been here for a very long time. Uh, Nigeria have not played at the AFCON for the last two editions. It's going to be a tough match. For, I expect both coaches to, re to rotate their squads, you know, give those boys who haven't had uh, playing time to at least uh, get something. For, in terms of uh, mental strength between the two teams, I think Tunisia come in with better mental strength. Uh, Algeria went, uh, Nigeria went out perhaps in the most brutal of ways, conceding a last-minute goal. It had a very negative effect on their, on their mental strength. And if they can recover to, to get their mental strength back and face this match with the opti optimism, and the confidence that they usually play with, I think it's going to be a very interesting match. But uh, Tunisia have an edge heading into the game tonight. Sande, watch the game for us and we'll catch uh, up with you again tomorrow. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Sande. Africa 54 sports guru, Sande Shomari, Thank you. reporting live for us from Cairo. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a look at the political impact of the latest firestorm triggered by tweets from U.S. President Donald Trump. We'll be back.
I am Sheka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. Now, in U.S. political news, four Republicans joined every Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives Tuesday evening to approve a resolution condemning racist remarks made by President Donald Trump about four minority Democratic Congresswomen. Africa 54's Vincent McCory has the details. The House resolution, which passed 240 to 187, strongly condemns Trump's racist comments that have legitimized an increased fear and hatred of new Americans and people of color. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi called for the chamber to unite in condemning the president's racist tweets. These comments from the White House are disgraceful and disgusting, and these comments are racist. How shameful to hear him continue to defend those offensive words, words that we have all heard him repeat, not only about our members, but about countless others. Our caucus will continue to forcefully respond to those attacks on our members, which reflect a fundamental disrespect for the beautiful diversity of America. The majority of Republicans rejected the resolution that condemned the president from their party. The very essence of the, the resolution, which has issues uh, beyond, needs to be considered. And when we do this, then I think, as I said in my opening, and I'll stick by what I said then, that this needs to be voted down. This does not need to go forward, and we need to get to a certain time when we are back to literally doing the people's business. Trump, who has been under fire since making the comments in a tweet Sunday, has not backed down. He tweeted praise for the Republicans who voted against the resolution and to continue his criticism of Congresswomen Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, and Rashida Tayyip. Trump, who has said the lawmakers should leave the United States, was asked earlier Tuesday where they should go. It's up to them. Go wherever they want or they can stay. But they should love our country. They shouldn't hate our country. Trump set off a firestorm by telling the four Democratic lawmakers to go back to their countries and fix their homelands before they attack him and the United States, although all four are U.S. citizens, with Somali refugee Omar a neutralized U.S. citizen. The targets of Trump's attacks appeared before Reporters Monday in a collective and blistering show of force to rebut the president's attacks against them. Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory with that report. Now, President Donald Trump and many of his Republican allies in the U.S. Congress are on the defensive after critics deplored what they said were racist comments by, and tweets by the president urging four Democratic Congresswomen to return to their home countries for being critical of the U.S. All four of the lawmakers are U.S. citizens and three of them were born here in the U.S. This latest firestorm has exposed sharp divides on politics, on politics rather, and race in America. He is VOS Jim Malone. At the White House, a defiant President Trump stood by previous comments urging four women Democratic House members to leave the country if they are unhappy. You look at what they've said. I, I have clips right here. The most vile, horrible statements about our country, about Israel about others. Uh, it's up to them. They can do what they want. They can leave, they can stay, but they should love our country and they should work for the good of our country. 
Trump's comments aimed at the four Democrats of color brought a broadside of criticism from critics accusing him of being a racist and a bigot. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer. Look, I think what President Trump did was just uh, despicable to appeal to the worst in human instincts to divide America um, is not what any president has done. There was outrage as well from several Democratic presidential contenders, including the frontrunner, Joe Biden, campaigning in Iowa. There has never been a president in American history who has been as so openly racist and divisive as this man. Imagine what it says around the world. Some Republicans spoke up and accused the president of trying to divide the country. I wish we'd have moved past it, uh, but I'm afraid that uh, with the comments that have been hurled back and forth, we're back into the kind of divisiveness that is so destructive to our national spirit. Other Republicans were either quiet or preferred to sidestep the issue. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell said it was time for all public figures to soften their rhetoric. Well, the president's not a racist. The president's not a racist. And I think the tone of all of this is not good for the country. But it's coming from all different ideological points of view. That's the point. New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is among the four House members targeted by the president. She urged Americans not to be distracted by the president's attacks. And so the first note that I want to tell children across this country is that no matter what the president says, this country belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And it belongs to everyone. This latest clash between the president and Democrats so is a likely a preview of next year's presidential campaign. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens has died Tuesday at age 99. He served at the court as a conservative, but became its most outspoken liberal. Stevens had suffered a stroke one day earlier and passed away in a hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. When he retired in 2010 at the age of 90, the Chicago-born Stevens was the second oldest and second longest serving justice in the court's history. The conservative Stevens gradually developed into the leader of the court's liberal wing, generally siding with the abortion rights, gay rights against capital punishment and for affirmative action, which is aimed at helping African Americans and other victims of discrimination secure good jobs. The White House issued a statement late Tuesday offering condolences from President Donald Trump and his wife Melania. It's time for our technology segment and joining us now is our tech reporter Paul Ndiho with the news on the rising uh, retail markets in the continent. Paul. Uh, thanks uh, Esther. Online uh, retail stores that target the middle class are on the rise in Africa. The stores are aiming to meet a demand for products that our conventional stores appear to be struggling to satisfy. But Jumia Food, as a unit of Jumia Technologies, is looking beyond the middle class and plan to offer cheaper options to attract lower income earners. Jumia is Africa's largest e-commerce platform, primarily for electronics, fashion, and appliances that connect sellers with consumers. In April, upon being listed on the New York Stock Exchange, it became Africa's first sub-Saharan African unicorn, a private company with a value of at least $1 billion to taste the sub-Saharan public market. Commonly dubbed as the Amazon of Africa, the platform delivers food and beverages to 11 countries, uh, joining other multinational companies such as Uber and China's Huawei Technologies, who are looking to grow their customer base on the continent beyond the middle class. We're also looking now to, to target this mass market customer that is really starting to come online over the last couple of years for the first time realizing that a level of, of radical convenience and assortment is not just the preserve of, of you know, the, the, the upper classes. It's now available to the mass market because 
the level of sophistication of, of technology, um, the level of experience that we now bring to on-demand means that we can hit a price point that's attractive to them. Jumia Food has one million customers across 30 African cities, including Lagos and Casablanca. Kenya, however, is its biggest market. Its platform there has 4,000 restaurants are offering everything from local cuisine to international fast foods from the likes of KFC, Pizza Hut, and McDonald's. Jumia follows Uber, which introduced low-cost quick-trip option called Chap Chap to users in Kenya in 2018. It has also added a motorcycle service in Uganda and a rug show in Tanzania. You know, five years ago, six years ago, I considered this to be a, a food delivery business. Uh, and what happened over the years is that we built up a very large base of customers and we developed an extremely deep expertise in on-demand delivery uh, technology. And when you have those two assets, uh, you know, we recognize that food is probably the, the biggest opportunity that we have in the market, but we can leverage those assets to serve customers in other areas. The online giant is betting that as more Africans reach the middle class status, people whose average daily spending is between $2 and $20, according to the African Development Bank, the demand for their services will rise. Africa's growing population is expected to lead to an increase in consumer spending to $2.2 trillion by 2030, from $680 billion in 2018, according to the African Development Bank and other UN agencies. We have around 4,000 vendors on the platform. Um, and the way I like to think about it is that we have roughly, I'd say maybe 99% or so of, of the vendors that we want to have on the platform. Uh, on the vendor's side, it's not a numbers game. It's really a quality and assortment uh, and trust game. Jumia's shares are skyrocketed after an initial public offering on the New York Stock Exchange. It raised $196 million, selling 13.5 American depository shares at $14.50 each with the expected range of 13 to 16 dollars the lagos nigeria best tech farm now has over 4 million customers but critics say the retail platform isn't profitable despite its sales jumping up by almost 40 percent to 147 million dollars last year that's uh, today's uh, take a reporter uh, back to you esther thank you paul great reporting as usual paul all right, be sure to join Paul Ndiho each Wednesday for another technology segment right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.